I just like the sound of the, <laughs> of the singing bowl. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Ed Cosper, and uh, I'd just like to welcome you and to tell you how much we're glad to have you here. It's exciting this morning. I'm Ed, as I said, and I'm the worship associate this morning. I uh, do a few things around the, the congregation. I sing in the choir. I uh, am a ministry associate, and uh, I'm sort of charged with worship. Uh, and uh, I'm a part of the uh, ministerial search committee as well. So um, I, I, I try to stay active, and uh, hopefully... Uh, I can contribute to this congregation and make it special. Joining us this Sunday as our guest speaker, <laughs> guest speaker, <laughs> is Reverend Jeff Jones. Reverend Jeff served the Emerson UU congregation from 2010 to 2017, at which time he was named Minister Emeritus. In 2017, Reverend Jeff chose to pursue community ministry, and his calling and ministry only deepened in his six years serving a community in Asheville, North Carolina. He and his spouse, Carol Buffin, recently moved to Smyrna, Georgia, and he is delighted to be part of our Emerson congregation while he continues to serve as a community minister. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Jeff this morning to uh, the pulpit. Reverend Jeff. <laughs> wow, this feels good. This feels good. Thank you, Ed, for that very warm welcome. Gracias, Ed, por la calidad bienvenida. Bienvenido. Good morning and welcome. Buenos dias y bienvenidos. As we begin our time of worship together, let us prepare our hearts. Al comenzar nuestro tiempo juntos, preparemos nuestros corazones. Come, come, whoever you are. Ven, ven, quiera que seas. Whomever you love, quien quiera que ames. Whatever your image of the sacred. Cualquiera que sea tu imagen de lo sagrado. May you find here room for your spirit. Que encuentres aquí espacio para tu espíritu. And in this people, a community. Y en esta gente, una comunidad. We are delighted that each and every one of you is here. Estamos encantados de que todos y cada uno de ustedes estén aquí. Our chalice lighting words this morning are by the Reverend Suzelle Lynch. They're entitled, Awaken to the Work. The fire of love burning deep in every human heart calls us to awaken. Awaken to the work of justice. Awaken to the work of compassion. Awaken to the work of community. For in this time of human suffering and exaltation, we are called beyond awakening into action. May the chalice flame we now light guide our hearts in service to the greater good, which holds all living things in its holy embrace. Now, in the spirit of the beloved community, please take a moment to greet and welcome each other to this new day as we share our congregational affirmation. We need not think alike to love alike. Those in the sanctuary, feel free to move around and offer a greeting to others and those online. Hi, folks out there. Join, you can unmute uh, to say hello or, join, or uh, say hello in the chat function.
Hold it, hold it, hold it. Don't sit down, don't sit down. <laughs> if you'll continue to stand and join us this morning in singing our first hymn. Uh, the hymn is in your gray hymnal. It's also projected. Uh, it's going to be hymn 361, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In. And do we have some words? Good morning. I'm so glad to hear. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Um, we're going to be singing this hymn um, in English and in Spanish. So as you see up here, we have an English version, uh, English first verse, and a Spanish, then another English, and then a Spanish. So um, in, t in terms of getting the pronunciation in Spanish, I just wanted to ask you to repeat after me um, the Spanish lines. I'm just going to say one line, and then you repeat it once, and we'll try to get this um, quick, right? So the first Spanish one would be, Ven, ven, alégrate hoy. Ven, ven, alégrate hoy. Ven, ven, alégrate hoy. Ven, ven, alégrate hoy. Es hoy un día muy feliz. Es hoy un día muy feliz. Ven, ven, alégrate hoy. Ven, ven, alégrate hoy. And then the second, um, the fourth verse, which would be the second Spanish verse, would be, Ven a escuchar la canción. 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 Es hoy un día muy feliz. Es hoy un día muy feliz. Ven, ven, alégrate hoy. Ven, ven, alégrate hoy. Ok. Excellent. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Today will be a joyful day. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Ven, ven, alegrate hoy. Ven, ven, alegrate hoy. Es hoy. Good morning. Um, my name is Michael Lukens, and I serve as your Director of Family Ministries. Uh, at this time in our service, we pause to reflect on, to share the joys, sorrows, and concerns in our lives, and light candles of shared concern. Prior to the service, we light these candles that hold our collective sorrows and hope. These candles recognize the collective pain and suffering of the Cherokee and Muscogee nations of people who lived on this land before us, the Africans who were brought to this land and enslaved, and the pain and suffering in all nations of people where there is conflict and injustice. Before our service each week, you are invited to add to this table for this care table, uh, excuse me, Add to this care table, lighting a candle for anyone you are holding in your heart. May all these lights humbly remind us of our interconnection and the impact of our collective actions. May they be the light of hope for peace among all people. We now turn 
to our personal joys, sorrows, and concerns. You are invited to write a personal note in our care book prior to the service. It is located at the entrance to the sanctuary, or you may email us at pastoralcare at emersonuu.org. Together, let us celebrate these joys that have been shared with us. First, from Winscout. My husband, Jim, has been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. He is getting medication, which is helping a lot. From Michael and Douglas, myself. On Friday, our fourth grandchild was born. A boy, seven pounds, 15 ounces. Rowan Devlin Lukens is doing marvelously. He's so smart and so cute. And Grandpa is in love, okay? Just going to say that right here. Grandpa's in love. Um, but grateful that Mom, Dad, and Baby are doing well. Except I will say, this boy's taking Dad down. He's tired in a whole new way. <laughs> Our next joy comes from Jeannie Young. So grateful for such a beautiful day. And with an open heart, let us hold these sorrows and concerns. This one is from Shagat and Ronnie. It is a sorrow. My father passed away Friday morning. He was a beautiful soul, very loving and giving, and much loved by everyone who came to know him. We know that there may be joys, sorrows, and concerns not spoken. As Douglas has lit our candles, please feel free to say out loud or type in the chat the name of someone you are holding in your heart today. Please join me in a moment of silence as we allow ourselves to feel a part of this community of care. Let us send our heartfelt caring intentions to each other and to all beings everywhere by offering the Buddhist prayer of loving kindness. Please repeat the words after me. May we all be filled with loving kindness. May we all be filled with loving kindness. May we all be free from harm and suffering. May we all be well in body heart and mind. May we all be at peace. Blessed be. Good morning. Georgia is one of eight states who doesn't accept the available federal money to provide lunches to low-income kids in the summer when school is out. And yet one in eight Georgia children is a victim of food instability. That's more than a half a million children who don't know where their next meals are coming from. The Must Ministry Summer Lunch Program reaches 6,300 children in eight counties for weekly food distributions, but only with the help of churches like ours. Churches play a key role by collecting the food and making each kit with five breakfasts and five lunches to last a week. I'm Mary Miller, and I'm on the social justice leadership team. The Must Ministry Summer Lunch Program is our May partner organization for Share the Basket. The money we gather will be used to purchase the food for the lunch kits. Then on July 9th, during second hour, our children and youth will assemble the lunch kits. We will also be looking for volunteers to help with shopping, organizing, assembling, and delivering the kits. 
Must also provides books for the kids, and we will be gathering gently used children's books to also donate for the program. Today and all through June, a box for the book donations will be next to the must barrel in the front of the church. Must lunches are provided for kids from ages 1 to 17, so keep that in mind with the books as well. And in addition to this, Lindsay Tomac purchased items to make 24 birthday kits to take to the Must Distribution Center because kids have birthdays during the summer too. Supplies to make a cake and party hats and candles and all that are available and we're doing that today. So if children and youth want to help us put these together, we'll be in the cry room during second hour today putting the kits together and we'll be delivering them. Thank you. So this morning, I have a story for all ages, and I would like to invite the young and the young at heart to please come forward for a story. Hey. Wow. Well, it's good to see you all this morning. This morning, I am going to tell a story about a young girl who moved to a new country. And she was courageous. She was very brave. Now, she moved from Mexico to the United States. She moved from the city of Juarez. And so I actually, I have six friends from Juarez, and I brought them all with me here this morning. They truly are all from Juarez. They are friends of mine. I'm going to leave them right there. Or do I pass this around? Okay. And I want to thank Patricia, who's going to help me tell the story. The story is called, My Diary from Here to There, Mi Diario de Aquí Hasta Allá. It's by Amada Irma Perez, and the illustrations are by Maya Cristina González. Querido diario, dear diary, I know I should be asleep already, but I just can't sleep. If I don't write this down, I'll burst. Tonight, my brothers, Mario, Victor, Hector, Raul, Sergio, and I all climbed into bed. I overheard Mama and Papa whispering. They were talking about leaving our little house in Juarez, Mexico, where we, where we have lived our whole lives, and moving to Los Angeles in the United States. But why? How can I sleep knowing we might leave Mexico forever? I'll have to get to the bottom of this tomorrow. Hoy, durante el desayuno, mamá lo explicó todo. Today at breakfast, mamá explained everything. She said, papá lost his job. There's no work here at all. We know that moving will be hard, but we want the best for you. Try to understand. I thought the boys would be upset, but instead they got really excited about moving to the United States. The big stores in El Paso sell all kinds of toys, and they have escalators to ride, and the air smells like popcorn. Yum. And I, am I the only one who is scared of leaving our home, our beautiful country, and all the people we might never see again? 
Hoy, mi mejor amiga Michi y yo caminamos al parque. My friend Michi and I walked to the park today. We passed John, Don Nacho's corner store and the women at the tortilla shop, their hands blurring like hummingbird wings as they worked the dough over the griddle. At the park, we braided each other's hair and promised never to forget each other. We picked out a smooth, heart-shaped stone to remind us always of our friendship, of our little park, of Don Nacho and the tortilla shop. I've known Michi since we were little, and I don't think I'll ever find a friend like her in California. You're lucky your family will be together over there, Michi said. Her sisters and father work in the U.S. I can't imagine leaving anyone in our family behind. Bueno, diario, este es el plan. Okay, diary, here's the plan. In two weeks, we leave from my grandmother's house in Mexicali, right across the border from Calexico, California. We'll stay with them while Papa goes to Los Angeles to look for work. We can only take what will fit in the old car Papa borrowed. We're selling everything else. Papa and Papa keep talking about all the opportunities we'll have in California. But what if we're not allowed to speak Spanish? What if I can't learn English? Will I ever see Michi again? What if we never come back? Hoy, mientras estábamos empacando, papá llamó a su lado y me dijo, Today, while we were packing, papá pulled me aside. He said, Amada, mi hija, I can see how worried you've been. Don't be scared. Everything will be all right. But how do you know what will happen to us, I said. He smiled. Mija, I was born in Arizona in the States. When I was six, not, not a big kid like you, my papa and mama moved our family back to Mexico. It was a big change, but we got through it. I know you can too. You are stronger than you think. I hope he's right. I'll need to pack my special rock and you, diary. We leave tomorrow. Nuestro viaje fue largo y duro. Our trip was long and hard. At night, the desert was so cold, and we had to huddle together to keep warm. We drove right along the border, across from New Mexico and Arizona. Mexico and the U.S. are two different countries, but they look exactly the same on both sides of the borders, with giant saguaros, cacti, pointing up at the pink-orange sky and enormous clouds. I made a wish on the first star I saw. Soon there were too many stars in the sky to count. Our little house in Juarez seemed so far away. Llegamos a Mexicali, Mexicali, muy tarde en la noche. We arrived in Mexicali late at night, and my grandparents, Nana and Tata, and all our aunts, uncles, and cousins, there must be 50 of them, welcomed us with a feast of tamales, beans, pan dulce, and hot chocolate with cinnamon sticks. It's so good to see them all. Everyone gathered around us and told us stories late into the night. As much as I try, I can't sleep. I keep thinking about Papa leaving for Los Angeles tomorrow. Papa se fue a Los Angeles esta mañana. Papa left for Los Angeles this morning. Nana comforted Mama, saying that Papa is a U.S. citizen, so he won't have a problem getting green cards from the U.S. government. Papa told us that we each need a green card to live in the States because we weren't born there. I can't believe Papa's gone. Tio Tito keeps trying to make us laugh instead of cry. Tio Raul let me wear his special medalla. And Tio Chato even pulled a silver coin out of my ear. The boys try to copy his tricks, but coins just end up flying everywhere. They drive me nuts sometimes, but today it feels good to laugh. Hoy recibimos una carta de papá. We got a letter from papá today. I'm pasting it into your pages diary. My dear family, I have been picking grapes and strawberries in the fields of Delano, 140 miles north of Los Angeles, 
saving money and always thinking of you. It's hard, tiring work. So far, getting your green cards has been difficult, for we are not the only family trying to start a new life here. Please be patient. It won't be long before we are all together again. Hugs and kisses. Papa. I miss Papa so much. Finalmente, Papa nos ha mandado nuestras tarjetas. Finally, Papa sent us our green cards. We're going to cross the border at last. He will meet us in Los Angeles. The whole family is making a big farewell dinner for us tonight. Everyone is sad to see us go. Nana gave me a new journal to write in for when I finished this one. She said, never forget who you are and where you are from. Keep your language and culture alive in your diary and in your heart. We leave this weekend. I'm so, and so excited I can hardly write. Qué tam camino tan largo. What a long ride. One woman and her children got kicked off the bus when the immigration patrol boarded to check everyone's papers. Mama held Mario and our green cards close to her heart. Papa was waiting at the station just like he promised. We all jumped into his arms and laughed, and Mama even cried a little. Papa's help felt, hugs felt so much better than when he left us in Mexicali. Hoy le escribí a Michi. I, write it to, I wrote to Michi today. Dear Michi, I have stories for you. Papa found a job in a factory, and we're, and we're living in a creaky old house in El Monte, east of Los Angeles. It's not at all like Juarez. Every day I hold my special rock, and I think about home, Mexico, and our walks to the park. Papa says we might go back for the holidays in a year or two. Until then, write me, missing you, Amada Irma. Bueno, diario, por fin encontré un lugar donde puedo sentarme y pensar y a escribir. Well, diary, I found, finally found a place where I can sit and think and write. It may not be the little park in Juarez, but it's pretty. You know, just because I'm far away from Juarez and Michi and my family in Mexicali, it doesn't mean they're not here with me. They're inside my little rock. They're here in your pages and in the language that I speak. And they're in my memories and in my heart. I am stronger than I think in Mexico and the States anywhere. P.S. I've almost filled this whole journal and can't wait to start my new one. Maybe someday I'll even write a book about our journey. The end. And you know what? She did write a book about her journey. And this is the book about her journey. So I want to leave you with some questions. I'm wondering which part of the book you liked best? Does anybody wish to share? What part of the book did you like best? Here's another question. I wonder, wonder which part of the story you think is most important. And I wonder, how do we welcome someone who does not speak English? Maybe those are questions for all of us to think about. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Shall we stand and sing our youngest children to their classes this morning? Yes.
Now, let's take a moment, a time of centering, a quieting ourselves, coming into the present. I'd like to share with you a meditation titled Body and Breath by Mary Gear. I invite you to imagine holding a ball of light. It might be a glass ball reflecting the light of the sun. Not too hot, just warm and comforting to your touch. It might be a beach ball, light and airy and colorful. Or any other ball that you can imagine. As your body is comfortable, as you breathe in, raise that ball to the sky, toward the sun. Imagine your ball absorbing the warmth and light of the sun, warm, cozy, comforting. And as you breathe out, lower your ball. Lower your ball to your belly, soaking in the warmth and the light. Breathe. Once more, as you breathe in, Raise your ball to the sky, toward the moon and the stars, the cool and quiet night sky. Stars glowing in the vastness of space. Imagine your ball absorbing the coolness and the quiet of night. As you breathe out, lower your ball to your belly. Soaking in the cool and the quiet of night. One last time now. As you breathe in, raise your ball to the sky towards all the planets and solar systems and galaxies out in the vast and beautiful universe. Imagine your ball connected to that vastness, absorbing the mystery and the beauty of space. As you lower your ball to your belly, Soak in the mystery and beauty of the universe. Breathe. In gratitude for this day, for this earth, for this community, for this life we pray, blessed be, amen. That's not a good start. <coughs> or as I'm fond of saying, <clears throat> that was embarrassing. I'm going to take a second <clears throat> and let that water go down. <clears throat> well, good morning. <clears throat> good morning, Emerson. <clears throat> the, voice, the voice will come back. 
It is so wonderful to be back with you. It is a joy to see so many familiar faces and to see so many new faces. <clears throat> I'm grateful to Reverend Deborah for the opportunity to speak here today and to Ed, Patricia, Sarah, Emily, Keith, Claude, Josh, Douglas, Bruce, Mary, our greeters, our choir members, everyone who helped put this service together today. Thank you. Thank you. For those who don't know me, I am Jeff Jones. As Ed said, I was the minister here from 2010 to 2017. And in 2017, I moved to Asheville, North Carolina to become a Unitarian Universalist community minister. My reasons for changing to community ministry were that after serving amazing congregations for 20 years, I felt the urge to create my own ministry in the community. I did so by teaching and studying nonviolent or compassionate communication, by supporting the Black Lives Movement Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter movement in Asheville, um, in, as a bus rider and a transit advocate, as a vegan, and in an effort to end animal torture in our food processing system, by committing an act of civil disobedience with Extinction Rebellion and being sentenced to to community service, and from August of 2021 to July of 2022, I spent a year in El Paso, Texas, welcoming and offering hospitality to refugees and asylum seekers. Excuse me. It was an amazing six years in Asheville. And now, having moved back to Cobb County, I look forward to serving as a community minister here. Like many Unitarian Universalist ministers, ministry was my second career, or is my second career. My first career was as a software engineer. But I was so enamored, and I am still so enamored with Unitarian Universalism that I made a career change in the 1990s. One friend, however, insisted that I would continue to work with software. It would just be of the human variety. <laughs> Others suggested that my career change was a shift from the rational to relational, from programs to people, from the logical to the liturgical. Who knew that my career change would make poets out of my friends? What I need you to know, though, is that Unitarian Universalism gifted me with the breath of life. It sounds dramatic, but at the age of 31, I could not figure out why traditional religion did not work for me. I wanted a sense of community and a place where I would be accepted with my often annoying questions about religion. I certainly found acceptance, I found community, and I found so much more. I found a faith tradition that transforms lives, that welcomes all people, and I found a faith that works for justice and lives its principles both in the congregation and in the community. A couple of years ago, as a community minister and wanting to both use and improve my Spanish, when the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee said that Annunciation House, a nonprofit, was looking for year-long volunteers at the border in El Paso, I checked with my partner, Carol, thank you, Carol, and I decided to apply. I was fully vaccinated, and I felt the risks were minimal, and the opportunities were great. And what is more, Carol came to El Paso and served for two weeks as well. As I said earlier, I went to El Paso for a year, to offer welcome and hospitality to refugees and asylum seekers. Shortly before I left, I told my Asheville friend, Carmen Ibarra, that I was going to Asheville, excuse me, I was going to El Paso to welcome refugees. She paused, and then she said how grateful she was that I was going. She said that when her dad arrived in this country, no one welcomed him. With Carmen's words as my constant companion, the first word I uttered to anyone who entered our shelters was welcome. 
You need to understand that many, perhaps most of the guests arriving at our shelters have just completed often months-long, arduous journeys, risking their very lives to get here. I made it my mission to welcome them from my heart. As you may know, the U.S. deports many refugees. Many others are allowed to enter the country and are given court dates, and many enter without documentation. To my surprise, I learned that since 2014, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, would bring refugees to the network of Annunciation House shelters and churches in El Paso. Annunciation House, in addition to a warm welcome, provided basic hospitality, food, clothing, a shower, a bed, hygiene products, toys for kids, while our guests, families, or friends in the U.S. purchased airline or bus tickets for them to leave El Paso. Annunciation House would then arrange transportation to an El Paso bus station or the airport and provide a travel bag for them. And another group of volunteers would help our guests at the El Paso airport. My experience at the border was clearly profound. The first shelter I served at was Casa del Refugiado. It was the size of three football fields, and it could house 1,000 to 1,500 guests. We often received one to 200 guests per day from dozens of different countries, predominantly Spanish-speaking. At Casa del Refugiado, there were five year-long volunteers and many community volunteers from the El Paso area, and a steady stream of short-term or usually two-week volunteers from all over the United States and other countries as well. The long-term volunteers met each weekday morning for a time of reflection. Once when it was my time to lead reflection, because El Paso was known for its murals found all over the city, I invited each volunteer to imagine a mural that represented what was happening at Casa del Refugiado. In my own imagined mural, the first panel was of 40 men and women exiting the ICE bus. They exited the bus in an orderly fashion, as if stepping out of line would impose some penalty by ICE. Each person exiting the bus was dressed in the same uniform, the same color t-shirt, the same color sweats, the same color and style of flip-flops. Their faces were full of fear and anxiety, having no idea what was to happen next. In the next panel of my mural, the men and women were warmly greeted with the word welcome with all of the enthusiasm we could muster. We let our guests know that they were free, free to move about our shelter. They no longer had to ask permission to go to the restroom or to use their cell phone. This was invariably met with cheers and tears of joy. In the next panel, we are inside the shelter. If at all possible, our, our guests had received clothes of their own choosing out of our clothing bank. Also depicted were men and sometimes women who would play soccer in our cavernous shelter. And I had the very distinct memory of a few young women running through the shelter, their long black hair now clean for who knows how long, flowing in the wind behind them. Let me interject that we also received many families, and so this panel also included children playing freely. In my final panel, our guests are boarding a bus for the airport or bus station. There is a certain amount of welcome disorder, and each guest is uniquely dressed. There is laughter and joy as they prepare to make their journey to be with family and friends. It was a profound experience. I will come back to this story in a few moments. There is another way that I was profoundly touched by my service in the shelters. 
The second shelter I served at was called Annunciation House. It was the original building of our organization's, organization's founding in the mid-1970s. You need to know that not all our guests are brought to us by ice. At the second shelter I served at, in addition to individuals and families, we received injured refugees brought to us by hospitals. I estimate that over the six months that I lived and served at this much smaller shelter, we served more than 20 guests who had fallen from the border wall. After they were initially treated at the hospital, they stayed with us in preparation for a surgery or an ankle or a leg. We gave them their prescribed pain medications. We took them to their pre-op appointments, to their outpatient surgeries, and they stayed with us as they prepared to travel post-surgery. One man stands out in my heart. 29, 20, hmm, knew this is going to be hard. 29 years old and a father of five. Juan, Juan was an indigenous farmer from Guatemala, who could no longer support his family on the land. He, though, had not fallen off the wall, but had been hit by a car and then an 18-wheeler while trying to avoid border patrol. His friends who were with him called his family in Guatemala and told them he was dead. But he was not. He was taken to the hospital he had three emergency surgeries, including a leg amputated above the knee, and then brought to us. I was present in late December 2021 when he came to us by ambulance on a stretcher. And I had the good fortune of being the long-term volunteer responsible for all of his follow-up appointments, probably 20 to 30 of them, between pain management, wound care, a follow-up surgery for nerve realignment, and physical therapy. At my going away party seven months later, Juan had just received his prosthesis paid for by Annunciation House. Juan will forever be imprinted on my heart. After six months at my second shelter, I was asked to be the site coordinator at our third shelter, Casa Vides. Like each shelter, we received families and individuals, but Casa Vides also received special cases. A number of refugees are the victims of crimes, and they need to remain in the area while HSI, Homeland Security Investigations, who knew that existed, Homeland Security Investigations did further investigation. At Casa Vides, a smaller shelter, we also received a number of transgender guests. I knew before arriving in El Paso that Annunciation House welcomed the LGBTQ plus community at our shelters. I don't know the experience of our transgender guests with Border Patrol or, or when they were in detention. But in our shelter, it was incredibly affirming to be part of a heartfelt welcome where they could be fully themselves. Why have I told you these stories from the shelters? After some reflection, I realized that my experience at the border had similarities to my experience of Unitarian Universalism. Let me say that again. My experience at the border had similarities to my experience of Unitarian Universalism. In the mural that I imagined at the large shelter, Casa del Refugiado, the series of panels represents the transformation of the experience of our guests. At all of our shelters, we transformed what had been a harrowing journey to one of heartfelt welcome and hospitality. The work of Annunciation House transforms the experience of our guests, those who are newly arrived in this country. 
I also believe that Unitarian Universalism transforms lives. It has certainly transformed mine. I first learned of Unitarian Universalism in 1989. The year before, though, I had just moved back to Atlanta to take a new job as a research scientist with the Georgia Tech Research Institute. As an avid volleyball player, I went in search of a volleyball league to play in. It would take me longer than you would think to realize that I had unknowingly joined a gay volleyball league. <laughs> I can laugh about this now, but in January of 1988, it was truly traumatic for me. At that time in my very traditional life, I, had, I didn't know anyone who was gay or lesbian. In my very traditional Southern life, I had internalized the worst stereotypes that society proffered around sexual orientation. I credit Unitarian Universalism and the many gay and lesbian friends I have made through our congregations and elsewhere with helping me overcome my homophobia. So yes, Unitarian Universalism, like Annunciation House, can be a transformative experience for those who come through our doors. Annunciation House also welcomed the injured and provided a place for healing. This has also been my experience of Unitarian Universalism. My father died in 2007, and shortly after his death, I experienced a broken relationship with a close family member who was deeply grieving my father's death. I could never have anticipated that my father's death would lead to me being estranged from someone I cared so deeply about. I recall the next month at a gathering of UU clergy sobbing uncontrollably as I tried to relate what I had just experienced. My colleagues did not offer platitudes, but sat with me, held me as I described my pain. So yes, Unitarian Universalism like Annunciation House is a place of comfort as we go through some of life's hardest moments. I want you to know that my family member has since apologized to me, and she didn't need to apologize. She herself, not knowing or understanding the grief that she, that we both were experiencing in 2007. Annunciation House also lives its values. The founders wanted to offer radical hospitality to those most in need, no exceptions. They welcomed all faiths, all sexual orientations, all gender identities. I also credit Unitarian Universalism with practicing radical hospitality. Just a few years ago, the Asheville Unitarian Universalist congregation offered sanctuary to a woman from Honduras and many members of the Asheville congregation actively participated as we provided her sanctuary in our building. So yes, my experience at Annunciation House was an experience of transformation, a place of nurturing and healing when life is hard physically or emotionally, and a place to practice radical welcome and hospitality. And Unitarian Universalism is a place of transformation, of nurture and healing when life is hard, and a place to practice radical hospitality. I recognize that not everyone can go to the border for a year and maybe not even two weeks, but let me be clear, it is an intense experience. But I believe that we can experience those important values of transformation, providing and receiving comfort and radical welcome and hospitality right here in our own congregation. In the few moments I have remaining, let me speak to the transformative, to the transformative nature of Unitarian Universalism that is happening right now. In the last few years, Unitarian Universalism, Unitarian Universalism 
has been looking deeply into what it means to be an anti-racist faith. More specifically, it is a period of active discernment about if and how we will accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. I need to tell you that this is some of the most transformative work I have ever seen our faith tradition take on. And to be brutally honest with you, it is not for the faint of heart. The current of white supremacy runs deeply in our culture and in each of us. It is for each of us to decide if and how to engage with this work. This is the work of transformation. It is the work of liberation. And it requires intentional effort on our part. This is just one way that I believe we need to deeply engage with the values of this faith. It is each of us being open to transformation. It is being present at more than on a Sunday service or at a Sunday service, as it requires us to be more fully engaged with the work of the congregation. And yet this congregation, Emerson, offers still more. We are a community that supports and sustains us both in the joys and when life is hard And it is a place of religious and spiritual exploration for children, youth, and adults. This congregation is now on a path to find a new minister. I was very impressed with the process that was outlined by the search committee. That letter and that letter that accompanied Reverend Deborah's video announcing her departure. Certainly there is sadness at Reverend Deborah's leaving. And yet the beautiful heart of Emerson will shine as you comfort one another and move forward together. Whether you are a long-term member, have been here for a few years, or maybe relatively new, maybe brand new, Unitarian Universalism is a radically different way of being. It takes work, it takes engagement, because no one tells you what to believe or how to be involved. To fully get what this congregation offers, we have to be engaged, and this will be different for each of us. I close with this quote from Howard Thurman. Don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive, and go do that, because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And if I can humbly add to Thurman's words, to come fully alive, we do so as part of a community to sustain and support one another as we together, as a congregation, offer love to an often bruised and hurting world. This is the call of our faith. May it be so.
Thank you, Bruce. Our closing words this this morning are by the Reverend J. Abernathy. They are entitled, Love is Our Greatest Purpose. We affirm that love is our greatest purpose. Accepting one another is the truest form of faithful living. The search for truth is our constant star. We pledge our hearts, our minds, and hands to challenge injustice with courage, to find hope in times of fear, and to live out our Unitarian Universalist values every day as a beloved community. Thus do we covenant with each other and with all that is sacred in life. Our closing hymn, I know we're going long sometimes, the work is long and the work is hard, but this song is so important. It's hymn number 305, it's in your gray hymnal, the words will also be here. Uh, We have hymn singers who will come and help us. As they're coming forward, I'm just going to encourage you to pay attention to the words in this hymn. Bruce said, if we're going long, maybe you'll skip this hymn, and I said, oh no, oh no, we're singing hymn 305. Um, Karen, do you have an explanation? whole entire hymn. And can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And the last, um, the last verse is the Spanish verse. So I just wanted to go over the um, pronunciation again for the, the, this one's very easy. Okay. So let, you can repeat after me. The last verse is in 305. You can look at it and because it's not up on the screen yet. Right. Okay. It is. Oh, it is? Oh, it's fine. Okay, great. It's um, de colores. De colores. De colores se visten los campos en la primavera. De colores se visten los campos en la primavera. De colores. De colores. De colores son los pajaritos que vienen de afuera. De colores son los pajaritos que vienen de afuera. De colores. De colores. De color es el, what, es, es, ok, perdonen, perdonen, ok, de color, de colores es el arco, el arco iris que vemos lucir, de colores es el arco iris que vemos lucir, de colores es el arco iris que vemos lucir, y por eso, Y por, y por eso, eso los grandes amores los grandes amores de muchos colores me gustan a mí de, de muchos colores me gustan a mí okay please stand in body or in spirit <laughs> Smile.
shake hands and say hello. All the colors, yes, the colors of people who know that their freedom is won. All the colors abound for the whole world around and for everyone under the sun. los campos en la primavera de colores de colores son los pajaritos que vienen de afuera de colores de colores es el arco iris que vemos lucir y por eso los grandes amores de muchos colores me gustan a mí por eso los grandes amores de muchos colores me gustan a mí. All right. Thank you, choir singers. We hope you have been nourished in heart and mind by our worship today. If you would like more information about Unitarian Universalism or about Emerson, please stop by our welcome table at the front entry. We hope that, uh, that you would join us after this service uh, and also join us next Sunday when um, we got a fabulous speaker next Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I'd tell you, it's going to be in the house. <laughs> and uh, I'll be talking about uh, my school bus ministry. As our chalice is extinguished this morning, please join in the final words that are posted in the chat and in the order of service. We extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until we are together again. Please join us for refreshments and fellowship, and uh, also please come and join us uh, for, for uh, service reflections here, right here in the sanctuary with uh, Reverend Jeff Jones. And I just want to take a stop a moment to say thank you. Uh, my thank you, my friend. <laughs> Our service is over, but uh, I'm supposed to say something, I know. Uh, but please go in peace and take peace wherever you go. Is that the right one? Thank you, guys. <laughs>